there's going to be a lot of righteous criticism aimed at Nvidia's new RTX 4080, but it's important to stress that there's nothing actually wrong with the Founders Edition we're reviewing today in terms of its construction, features and overall quality. Just like the uh, RTX 4090, it's a high quality product created by a company that's arguably at the top of its game, a firm at the pioneering forefront of graphics technology. It's important to separate the quality of the product from its pricing, which is an issue and is simply too high. Even at its MSRP baseline, and especially so with some of the third-party partner cards we've seen. Okay, so the new 4080 is a good chunk faster than any of the prior NVIDIA Ampere offerings, including the RTX 3090 Ti, but the performance boost doesn't always correlate with the price being charged, to the point where there are even data points to suggest that the $1599 RTX 4090 actually offers a better deal. The uh, Founders Edition we're looking at today arrives in the same packaging as the RTX 4090, and it has the same excellent chassis. The only difference is that while the same controversial 12 volt power socket is on the card, this time you get a dongle adapter with just three 8-pin PCIe inputs. That's still more than enough though, bearing in mind that the power-hungry RTX 3090 Ti shipped with the same adapter. The uniform design across both Ada Lovelace cards also means that you're getting the same video options. One HDMI 2.1 and three DisplayPort 1.4a ports. Here you can see how the RTX 4080 compares to its flagship partner and the upcoming, uh, well I guess it's the 4070 Ti, yet to be confirmed. Uh, but it's fair to say that the cutbacks from 4090 to 4080 are big wider and deeper than the specs differential we saw between RTX 3090 and RTX 3080. They're using different dyes for starters. You're getting around 59% of the compute power, 73% of the memory bandwidth, and two thirds of the VRAM. And yet you're paying 74% of the cost price of the flagship. So realistically, you should be expecting at least 74% of the RTX 4090's performance. And ideally, it should be a lot more, as users expect a better price versus performance ratio the cheaper the product gets, right? In fact, let's lay out exactly why pricing is such an issue with this card. The baseline cost of RTX 4080 is 1199 US dollars, while its predecessor had an equivalent $699 US MSRP, roughly a 72% increase in cost gen on gen. However, of all the top-end cards of the last generation, only the RTX 3080 was reasonably priced. Here's a performance snapshot showing RTX 3080 against the $1119 3080 Ti, the $1499 3090 and the hilariously priced $2000 3090 Ti, all based on the same chip, but everything from the 3080 Ti upwards simply does not offer the same kind of value as RTX 3080. So RTX 4080 is faster, faster even than 3090 Ti by a decent margin. It also has features last gen won't have, enormous improvements to the media engine, including dual AV1 encoders, the optical flow generator that makes DLSS 3 possible, but ultimately it's all about gaming performance, right? And to make pricing work, you kind of have to ignore that the RTX 3080, the 4080's predecessor, actually existed. And that's before we factor in the 4090, which adds further pressure to 4080 pricing, as we shall see in terms of just how much faster it is. And on top of that, there's further pressure from AMD's RDNA 3 offerings, which in value terms at least are also going to cause NVIDIA problems if AMD's marketing claims hold up. We'll get on to game performance shortly, but let's quickly cover gen-on-gen -gen efficiency. Energy efficiency varies according to the game you are running, of course. Uh, but if we stack up performance against power consumed, which is exactly what we've done in this table here, in all cases, the RTX 4080 reports power consumption beneath its 320 watt limit. And compared against prior 80 class cards, there are sizable efficiency advantages. Put simply, frame rates are considerably improved gen on gen, and especially when you're looking at RTX 3080 there, the performance advantage doesn't result in much of the way in increased power consumption. In fact, as you'll see, the RTX 4080 can deliver both a performance boost and a reduction in power consumption simultaneously in some workloads. 
But let's talk game performance specifically, where we pair the new wave of GPUs with a Core i9-12900K and 32 gigs of 6000 megatransfers per second G-Skill DDR5. We've completely revised our test bench to better reflect the future of gaming technology. That means we're zeroing in on titles using key engines and low-level gaming APIs, while we've beefed up representation for ray tracing and image reconstruction technologies. We're acknowledging that higher fidelity via ray tracing is a key feature of today's games, while also understanding that most people will be using technologies like DLSS or FSR2 to maximize performance while retaining those features. But first of all, I wanted to clear up something bizarre from some Nvidia marketing I saw that really had me worrying about the RTX 4080. This bar chart seems to suggest that native 4K performance for A Plague Tale Requiem sees the RTX 4090 outperform the 4080 by around 93%. The good news at least is that my testing shows a more narrow and more plausible deficit. This section from the beginning of the game actually causes frame drops on PlayStation 5. We can assume it's quite demanding. Here at native 4K, the 1490 outperforms 4080 by around 36% not 93%, thank God. Using DLSS 2, that 36% drops to around 28%. This title also supports DLSS 3 frame generation, and in combination with DLSS 2 quality or performance modes, the gap between 4080 and 4090 widens again to about 33% or thereabouts. I'd consider this differential to be more normal based on a non-RT workload, so my initial worries about the RTX 4080 based on Nvidia's own numbers can be ruled out. Now, if we look at performance more generally, it's typically the case um, that benchmarks coalesce around certain figures and GPUs are often described in reductive terms, like for example, RTX 3080 Ti is 10% faster than the 3080, or whatever. But as we'll see, there's quite a bit more variation this time, and the RTX 4080's relationship with the 4090 is more complicated than I expected. I'm going to be focusing on 4K performance for this one because anything lower leads to results uh, that can be influenced by CPU limits depending on the title. 1080p testing, basically a waste of time. I'm also going to start with RT performance because this is where the latest generation of GPUs are truly put through the ringer. This is Cyberpunk 2077 in its ultra-high RT mode using a developer test sequence. This is the full Monty, short of the Psycho ray tracing setting, but still a hefty workout. The issue here with the RTX 3080 trending under 3080 Ti is seemingly down to a lack of VRAM. The RTX 4080 powers ahead, beating the similarly priced 3080 Ti by 37% at 4K. My first takeaway though is that perhaps disappointingly, RTX 4080 is closer to 3090 Ti performance than it is to the 4090. RTX 4090 is almost 41% faster than the 4080, yet costs 33.3% more based on US MSRPs. Now, point is, value should be increasing as we go down the GPU stack, not decreasing. The trend of RTX 4090 offering performance uplifts higher than the difference in MSRP persists here in our second demanding raid facing test, Dying Light 2. This time that 33% increase in cost is delivering almost 45% of extra performance. 35 to 36% increase in performance there uh, for 4080 up against RTX 3080 Ti, uh, that's pretty impressive. And this does rise to 53% up against the card's notional predecessor, the RTX 3080 10 gigabyte version. But here's the thing, you're paying an extra 71, 72% for that 53% point boost. This is the primary issue facing the RTX 4080. Performance doesn't rise in line with its MSRP based on its notional last gen equivalent, while the more expensive card is once again offering a superior price versus performance ratio. The value issues facing the RTX 4080 abate just a touch in Codemasters F122, here benched at maximum settings with the full range of RT features enabled. So here, 4090 costs 33% more, um, but it's delivering around 37% more performance. Uh, that's one pressure point perhaps 
partially alleviated, but the fact remains that once again, you're paying a lot more money versus the 3080 than you're getting in terms of a frame rate upgrade gen on gen. And only by comparing against the overpriced RTX 3080 Ti do you get any notion or increase in price versus performance. Over to our control test now, high settings, high ray tracing, hosted in Alex Battaglia's Corridor of Doom, a known pressure point in the game. This causes all manner of problems as you're only getting a 39% improvement in performance against 3080, dropping to just 22 points against 3080 Ti. What's concerning here though, is that whatever pressures are facing the RTX cards here, the 4090 seems to be somehow immune. I had to test and retest this one, but it seems that here the 4090 flagship is around 48% faster than RTX 4080. It's a result that only makes the Halo product more attractive, bizarrely offering much more value. The Glacier engine from IO Interactive takes no prisoners with its ray tracing implementation and in common with all the titles tested so far, I guess realistically you'll be using an upscaling solution like DLSS to play at. Though to be fair, Hitman 3 here supports DLSS, FSR2 and XESS. But in terms of pure RT performance, the same kind of pressures on 4080 come into play here. Ultimately, the RTX 4090 is punching above its weight up against 4080 in terms of price versus performance with a nigh on 46 percentage point increase. And once again, you're seeing a performance uplift against the 3080, not in line with the cost increase. Still around 52% faster though. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, it's only a comparison against the uh, RTX 3080 Ti that paints RTX 4080 in a good light. 4080 ends up with an appreciable 38% lead. On to Metro Exodus, where the revised 4A engine is built around ray tracing as a foundational concept for its stunning real-time global illumination system. It's a showcase technological achievement for the current generation of consoles that only gets better on PC, where 4A doubles down on further visual fidelity, tessellation, hybrid RT reflections and more. The game works fine on AMD GPUs but delivers vast improvements to performance on Nvidia cards. This is an interesting example of where the performance differentials for the 4080 up against 3080 and 3080 Ti remain pretty much as expected at 50 and 39% respectively, but this time RTX 4090 does not scale quite so highly. Its lead is down to 36% in this title. Ultimately though, the new RTX 4080 still delivers frame rates closer to 3090 Ti than it does to RTX 4090. Onto a Marvel Spider-Man Remastered now, another game laudable for supporting all upscaling technologies, including Insomniac's own software solution, and yes, there's even DLSS3 functionality, as you saw in our 4090 review, and bespoke DLSS3 coverage. With this title, RTX 4080 falls into the same category of performance seen in Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition, in that the gap closes up against 4090, which commands a circa 36 percentage point lead over 4080. However, the very high RT preset seems to max out the 3080's 10 gigs of memory, resulting in a performance degradation that sees the 4080 pull ahead by 63%. The gap closes to just 31% when stacked up against RTX 3080 Ti, where 12 gigs of frame buffer memory seems to comfortably contain the game's requirements. We've delivered a big bunch of metrics revealing the ray tracing power of RTX 4080, but let's be honest, engaging RT is typically accompanied by the use of second generation upscalers like DLSS, FSR2 and XESS, so it's worth benchmarking these technologies working in concert. It's not factoring in image quality, mind you, where Nvidia enjoys a noticeable advantage, which is talking about raw performance here. We choose titles here that only support DLSS and FSR2, Though in terms of competitive analysis when considering a GPU purchase, remember that there are many more DLSS games than there are FSR2 titles. In fact, the vast majority of RT games support DLSS, and right now the same can't be said for any other upscaling technology. Returning to Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered, we actually find a game where the new generation of GPUs are so fast you may not even need upscaling. The results here are fascinating because 4090 only commands a small 10 to 11 percentage point lead over the 4080 in 4K DLSS performance mode. And this is because the game runs so fast we're hitting the CPU limits of the Core i9-12900K. 
We get close to it with RTX 4080 while RTX 4090 slams right into it. So I'd recommend DLSS quality mode or even DLAA on this one for the higher tier GPUs, depending on whether you're gaming on a 4K 60Hz or higher refresh rate display. Interestingly, the 3080's performance deficit disappears here, presumably upscaling from 1080p via DLSS alleviates the pressure on the 10 gigabytes of frame buffer memory. Uh, returning to our Cyberpunk benchmark, uh, based on an internal test sequence used by CD Projekt Red, and quite different from the standard benchmark, well, the gap between RTX 4080 and 3080 remains wide at 56%, but it's interesting to see the RTX 4090's performance differential reduced from circa 40% at native 4K to just 27% in the mode people are more likely to actually use. Could we be hitting the CPU limit here perhaps? Up against the 3080 Ti, 4080 still delivers a decent enough 32 percentage point lead. Dying Light 2, one of the most demanding RT workloads there is, also benefits a lot from DLSS as you might imagine. A 57% increase up against RTX 3080, dropping to a still impressive 42 point lead over 3080 Ti. Once again, a big performance lead for the 4090 at native 4K drops significantly with DLSS performance mode active. It's around 33 percentage points to the better, bringing it into line with its price point. Just a reminder though, we should be seeing value increase as we go down the stack, not decreasing or even sitting static as is the case here. Remember, the RTX 4090 is effectively a standalone Halo product with an extreme price tag, and 4080 pricing shouldn't be normalizing that as some kind of new standard. So far, it's not been the best start for the RTX 4080. We've seen appreciable gains against 3080 and 3080 Ti, but the gains against the non-Ti Ampere card are not in line with the price increase, and that's problematic. Meanwhile, key titles have revealed that the RTX 4090 actually offers better value in some scenarios, despite its monstrous cost. That changes now as we move into rasterization benchmarks, where the 4080 is much, much closer to its bigger brother. However, there may well be an argument here that the Ada Lovelace flagship is actually being held back by the CPU in a way that the RTX 4080 may not be. Something to bear in mind. Looking at Remedy's control, we do test a different area of the game compared to the RT benchmark, but even so, the 4090's massive lead is cut down to less than 30% overall. Suddenly, the price-performance ratio between the two cars shifts a touch in favour of RTX 4080. Though remember, as I just said, value should scale higher as we go down the GPU ladder. However, at the same time, RTX 4080 is still not living up to its price, when compared with results from the $699 RTX 3080. The new card is about 43% faster, but costs 72% more. A 27% increase in frame rate over 3080 Ti also trends under other results we've seen so far. 4K rasterization tests in Cyberpunk 2077 reveal performance that isn't a world away from the ultra-high RT preset. 4080 scores 42 frames per second here on average, up against 33 with all the RT bells and whistles enabled. So I'd venture to suggest that optimized settings would be preferable here, as well as the use of DLSS. Regardless, once again, RTX 4090 doesn't scale that well against the new 4080 with just a 22% lead. And it's not the CPU that's the problem there. There are scaling problems across the board with this one. The performance gains offered by the new Ada Lovelace card up against 3080 and 3080 Ti are around 10% off the pace at around 42% and 23% respectively. Not great. Doom Eternal is an interesting example of scalability when the top tier GPU in the lineup is actually too powerful for the CPU it is paired with. And we're using one of the fastest on the market. With a 53.5 percentage boost up against RTX 3080 and a 41 point uplift versus 3080 Ti, the card returns to its more familiar performance profile. However, RTX 4090 just 21 percent faster than 4080 and when you're talking about a circa 296 frames per second average in this sequence, we can be reasonably sure that the CPU is influencing and degrading the 4090's result. Gears 5 is our sole Unreal Engine 4 representative for GPU reviewing because it's one of the few titles on the engine that does not stutter. A 54-point lead over RTX 3080 dropping to 33% at 
over 3080 Ti. 4090 is about 31% to the better here. So thus far, rasterization tests seem to have blunted the 4090's advantage over 4080, but Hitman 3 reminds us that it's still there in some scenarios, even with no ray tracing involved. RTX 4090 still manages to deliver a 47 percentage point improvement over the RTX 4080 in this Dubai benchmark. Tellingly though, the performance differentials between 4080 and the 3080 and Ti models are from the last generation remain roughly in line with trends seen in other tests, at 46% ahead of 3080 and 34% ahead of 3080 Ti. Just a few more tests to go before we wrap up, kicking off with Forza Horizon 5, where the results with RTX 4080 looking down towards older generation parts reveal the same kind of performance differentials we've come to expect. It's a nigh on 48 percentage point boost to performance over RTX 3080, dropping to 36% versus 3080 Ti. The RTX 4090 only gets a 24 percentage point upgrade over the 4080, but we can be reasonably sure here that's a limit imposed by our CPU, not the graphics hardware. 4090 really is a performance beast. Onto the Rage engine now with Red Dead Redemption 2. The RTX 4080 falls into line with expectations when it comes to comparisons up against 4090, in non-RT workloads at least. Essentially, with the flagship, an extra 33% of cash money translates into a circa 30% of extra performance, though again, we should be expecting better value downstream from the Halo product. However, the already problematic pricing for the RTX 4080 comes into an even sharper focus when stacked up against prior offerings such as 3080 and 3080 Ti, where users get just a 36% and a 24% uptick in performance from 3080 and 3080 Ti respectively. Uh, this is an outlier more generally, but still strongly indicative of a product that isn't sitting at its natural price point. Finally, Shadow the Tomb Raider, the flagship 4090 trends above average with a 39% uptick over 4080, but elsewhere there are a few surprises, a 51% boost over the RTX 3080, dropping to around 34% up against the 3080 Ti. Okay, so those are the numbers, Mason, but what about the takeaway? When Nvidia first announced the RTX 4000 line of graphics cards, it did so by unveiling a vision of the future for PC gaming graphics. Innovations in terms of both software and hardware that offer exceptional increases to performance in the here and now, and effectively laying the groundwork for a new paradigm for PC graphics going forwards. Pretty amazing stuff. But the results have been mixed. On the one hand, RTX 4090 is one of the best Halo products we've ever seen, delivering astonishing performance. It's expensive, but it does something we've never seen before, and it's pretty awesome. Meanwhile, DLSS 3 looks like a highly promising technology, but it still requires a bit more work in terms of ironing out some of its issues. The point is, though, that it's a net positive, an enabler to improved experiences for PC gamers. However, the missteps of the RTX 4000 launch have only been partially rectified. All of the good stuff that Nvidia revealed at its announcement was overshadowed by the pricing problems. The RTX 4080 12GB model may well have been quote unquote unlaunched, but this does not address the fact that the one true RTX 4080 remains significantly overpriced in terms of price versus performance. It's overpriced compared to its direct predecessor, the RTX 3080, which delivers two thirds of the performance for just 58% of the RTX 4080's cost. It's overpriced compared to the RTX 4090, amazingly enough, which can actually show an improvement in price versus performance, uh, when the opposite should be true. It's also rewriting the rulebook in a way that simply doesn't make sense to the consumer. Typically, the more higher end the GPU, the lower the price performance ratio tends to be. Conversely, the lower down the stack you go, the better the deal you're supposed to get. I don't think that the RTX 4080 is delivering that. Those looking for a slightly cut down RTX 4090 with a decent discount are obviously going to be disappointed. And in fact, the 1199 US price point leaves little room for an RTX 4080 Ti based on the top end silicon. 
A cut down 4080 Ti at say 1399 US makes no sense when the full model, the full RTX 4090 would cost just 14% more. So you could stick with discounted Ampere cards instead. And all of the GA102 products from 3080 upwards are still great GPUs. Alternatively, you can wait for RX 7900 from AMD. But even here, we're seeing the Radeon team deploy the same strategy as Nvidia. Keep prices on the highest end card static, but increase prices on cards that should be offering more value. The gap in specs between 7900 XTX and 7900 XT is actually wider than the gap between 6900 XT and 6800 XT. But in AMD's case, the 7900 XT costs 38% more. Seems to me like flagships are staying where they are, but prices are being hiked on lower end cards. And AMD's only saving grace is that it's cheaper overall than Nvidia. Difficult times ahead, I'd say, but it certainly would be easier to recommend the 4080 if it were a thousand dollar card. But even then, that's still a hefty price increase gen on gen. And only maintaining status quo in terms of price versus performance versus RTX 3080. Summing up then, I have no hesitation in recommending RTX 4080 as a product, as a great piece of technology. But the current pricing makes little sense with the Founders Edition reviewed here. That's a shame, because the experience delivered by the product is pretty great. 4080 might not have quite the same wow factor as the 4090, but it's still highly impressive. However, the price premium is difficult to justify with pressure coming from so many different directions. So that's the end of this mammoth review. Please like, subscribe, share if so inclined and ring the bell for those notionally instant notifications. Do you have support to program? Join us for high quality video downloads of everything we do, early access to a ton of videos, bonus material, brilliant DF retro content and so much more. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this huge video, if indeed you did. And uh, just generally, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.